Hey, this is Zena. Today I want to talk about one of the most important events of the 1960s, and that was the May Revolt in France in 1968. Now, too often when we look at the 60s, we, uh, or at least the popular culture does, we get the, the cliches of sex, drugs, rock and roll. We get the cliches of hippies, nihilistic revolts and all this, there's the contrast between good and bad 60s and all that. And, well, and supposedly the 60s, supposedly, even I've, I've heard, have heard professors say that the 60s marked the end of conventional Marxist modes of politics, and so on and so forth. Well, there's a forgotten truism, which is actually the name of a paper that you can find in the description below. Um that a revolution can occur in an advanced capitalist society, namely France, in May of 1968. This French society was alienated, it was exploited. And it also showed probably the best proof that uh, without a revolutionary party of some sort, a revolutionary organization, that you're not going to take power. And this, this goes back to the French Communist Party, uh, which is pro-Soviet, and if we look at just going back to World War II, the Communist Party had really proven itself as a dedicated uh, resistance force. You know, it had really come up to the plate there. And I don't know how true this is, but I, I think there's some truth to it, that when French Communist members were being paraded to be shot before the Germans, they would sh yell out, long live the German Communist Party. So there was kind of an internationalist spirit there. Not totally, the party was still kind of nationalistic. But in 1946, when you had the first post-war elections, the French party had about 26%, and the, social, the, the socialists and the, even the broader left, they were kind of all drawn around its orbit. There were calls for nationalization, comprehensive social security, workers' control, trade union guarantees, pretty much a, a more just social order. And it seemed that this was going to come to France after the war. A lot of people were expecting it because that is what they, a lot of resistance fighters had fought for. And even though uh, the French Constitution after the war did include a lot of, a lot of like nationalizations and um, a more wa modern welfare state, there was no transcendence of capitalism. The French party remained committed to the established order, certainly with changes, but they were still committed to it. And this is, of course, also the period of the Cold War developing. We have martial aid coming in. We have the left kind of splitting between anti-communists, like the French uh, socialists, and we have the Gaullists coming in there. And France is also involved in two colonial wars, um, Pretty much going into the early 60s, we have Indochina or Vietnam, largely from 1945 to 1954, and Algeria from 1954 to 1962. And it kind of shows you, despite the so-called reforms of France, they were still a brutal colonial power. And there's, you know, bombings, there's torture, there's terror of the populace there. And it, it's a, it's kind of an understood thing that the French conservatives would want to maintain colonial rule. They're a bunch of scumbags. They support the established order. That's understandable. You can't fault them for being upfront that they're scumbags. Um, but the French communists and the French socialists are slightly different because supposedly they want something else. Well, the French socialists were committed to the war in Algeria, and they did a lot of the tortures. But the French, par the Communist Party supposedly was committed to uh, the Leninist idea of national self-determination. Well, not, not really. They condemned the early risings of the Algerians. And they, um, they also, they, they even supported initially the French socialist government when the war in Algeria was beginning. And it is true that the French party did come around to supporting the Algerian War of Independence, but it's really like half-hearted. And it really alienated them from a lot of the left in France that was actually moving to giving open support to the Algerian National Liberation Front. They were running arms, they were engaging in spy networks, and, and so on and so forth. 
And the, the, it seemed the French Communist Party was more interesting in staying respectful. And this is something that the French left that had really been energized with um, the Algerian war is taking issue with. And we also have the party was definitely wants reform. They're definitely moving away from any sort of extra parliamentary actions. And they're definitely more interested in parliamentary uh, alliances with the socialists. And they're purging all sorts of um, members of the French party, you know, um, those who are more inclined to support the Italian Communist Party, which is more open, and those who were, wanted more democratic, uh, Maoists, uh, even developing Trotskyist trends that were coming from the, the party. And we have, of course, the party was kind of, during the Gaulle, de Gaulle years, and he comes to power towards the tail end of the Algerian War, he kind of has like an almost an imperial presidency. That's not to say he was, um, he was in the mold of, say, Stalin or someone like that. He wasn't. Um, but he was very much a technocrat, this whole modernization. We have universities expanding under de Gaulle. We have which are, you know, these universities are expanding rapidly, but they're underfunded. There's so much bureaucratic mismanagement. They're overly centralized. And the fact is, the lessons that these kids were getting were kind of disconnected from everyday life. And the kids are dealing with um, questions of alienation. Well, what are we doing this education for? What about exploitation and capitalism? And this, the, And we further have... The, the students are definitely moving towards a critique of everyday life that you see in the general 60s. Well, there's a whole bunch of struggles associated in the universities. And by 68, in May, you have actually occupations of the Saban. And in response, and there's also street fighting associated with it, well, in response, you have workers seizing their factories. You have a general strike of about 10 million workers in France, the largest in French history, pretty much the whole country shut down. And de Gaulle is willing, actually, at some points, he's willing to have the army brought in to crush the protesters. It never gets that far. And the students, they're supported by um, not just the general students and a lot of the workers, but you have Trotskyists, Maoists, and anarchists who are definitely involved and they definitely want a revolution. But the French Communist Party and its trade union, the CGT, they're doing all they can to put the brakes on this. They betray the hopes of the revolution. When the students are fighting the police on the barricades, they're condemning them. Uh, when, this, when there's mass demonstrations against the French state, they're, they want to keep order. Um, they're condemning a lot of the student leaders. And... The established unions, which in many cases were allied to the Communist Party, but they're not pushing for seizing the factories, worker councils, uh, self-management. They just want wage increases. And they're doing all they can to bring all these demands of the workers back into established norms, back into their whole reformist uh, appeal. And... It's just a complete betrayal because there was a saying of it was either the students or Jean Paul Sartre who said it is impossible to make the revolution without the Communist Party and it is impossible to make the revolution with the Communist Party because the French Party was just so reformist, so embedded into the established order that they just didn't want to challenge it. They they were more concerned about upcoming elections than they were about their supposed program of socialist power. And the French party showed that it was – they were more afraid of the left, more afraid of the Gaulle state than in actually doing what they supposedly were founded to do, which was to take power. And without the, a, a party or an organization that committed to revolutionary change, uh, the French may, unfortunately, kind of foundered. And you had some – Notable attempts by the Maoists, the Trotskyists, and the anarchists to some extent to kind of fill that gap in the years ahead, but unfortunately, the French may, it didn't result in an overthrow. 
which is too bad. But the French May kind of shows it's not. It supposedly I was actually told in class that this that well it shows the failure of Marxist politics. I'm actually it actually shows the exact opposite. If we'd had a revolutionary party, it's possible it could have been a bid for power. And it also shows that um, the French May shows that the damage a reformist party can do, but it also shows the French May that there can be a revolution in an advanced capitalist nation. So this is just kind of a brief overview of the French May. So this is Ina, until next time.